It's not very often that I come across new manga and actually sit down and take the time to read it. Usually I just try and wait for a series to get high praise or a lot of people recommending it until I actually read a new manga. And so reading these three new Shonen Jump manga, Fabricant 100, Ichigoki's Under My Control, and Cypher Academy, it's been a kind of a new experience. It's something I don't usually do. But yeah, I just want to talk about some of the stuff I like within this manga and some of the stuff I don't like. But I just want to go in the order in which I read these series, so let's start off with Fabricant 100. Now you could tell that this series, this manga, is kind of dark. It almost reminds me of JJK, it kind of shares some similar elements, as in it's a battle action manga. And for now, that's really where the similarities end, so maybe it's not too similar to JJK. This story starts off with us learning about a doctor. And this doctor is obsessed with the idea of an ideal human being. And so he goes out of his way to start creating these things called fabricants. And they're supposed to be ideal human beings. The only bad part is that this doctor, he fails a whole lot. So he keeps failing and eventually the number of fabricants he has made reaches up to 100. And after he finishes the last one, he dies. We don't know how he dies. We don't really know anything. But now there's 100 fake human beings or 100 fabricants running around and yeah it's a very weird thing and so after we get this information we go to a train and there's this couple on this train there's a man and a woman and the man he spots some mysterious person running and trying to catch up to this train this person actually does manage to catch up getting very close to the window next to this man and the woman and actually grabs the woman kidnaps her and she's never seen again. And so the man, he's very distraught. He's absolutely devastated. His girlfriend just got taken away from him. And the worst part is that there's really nothing he can do about it. And this is where we meet our main character, Ashibi Yao. He's, he's a kid. He's like 15 years old, 14 years old. And he's with a woman, kind of a big woman. She kind of has some weird behavior. But eventually, this Ashibi and the man that got his girlfriend taken away, they end up meeting and Ashibi starts to talk to him about who the possible culprit is and asks him if the, the person who took his girlfriend away had scars on him or stitches on him. And the man says, yeah, the person did have stitches. And so Ashibi cuts himself using some weird little ring thing. And we find out that his blood attracts these fabricants. And the person who took this man's girlfriend away is actually a fabricant. And so this fabricant goes to Ashibi and tries to kidnap him also, but the woman that's with him just straight up demolishes him. And we learn that the woman that is with Ashibi is actually a fabricant herself, the last one that's ever been created, Fabricant 100. And so we get a bit of backstory as to who Ashibi is, why he's with Fabricant 100, and it turns out that Ashibi is part of a family, the Yao family. They have a very long life expectancy. They like live over 110 years years so yeah pretty long i guess they're very healthy or something but this is where we get introduced to a very interesting concept and that is the fabricants although you know they ended up being called a failure by the doctor by the one who created them they've decided to set out on a quest to try and become ideal humans themselves and to do that they gather body parts from anyone from other people real people to try and you know make themselves the ideal human being. And so Ashibi, being from this family that lives for a very long time, his body parts are very heavily sought after. And whenever he releases some blood or, you know, cuts himself and some blood comes out, these fabricants will always be attracted to him and go towards him. And if the story wasn't dark enough already, Ashibi's family has been killed by these fabricants. And as his family members were getting killed, his older sister went up to to him and told him to, you know, to live, to survive. So Ashibi, he made a deal with these fabricants that if they kill each other, then they could have his body in a few years when he's 18 and, you know, he's at the peak of his, I guess, development. But he manages to convince them that they should wait until he's older and if they want his body, they need to kill each other over it. And so Fabricant 100 kills all the fabricants who were there at this house, at Ashibi's house. And 
and now is traveling with them trying to you know take out a whole bunch of other fabricants and ashibi turns 18 she's gotta take his body parts very weird very very weird but we also learn the order in which these fabricants have been made is very important because it determines their strength and so the first fabricant that was made is very weak is the weakest out of the bunch and the last fabricant who is made fabricant 100 is the strongest and so you get this premise of ashibi and fabricant 100 traveling around uh wherever and finding these fabricants killing them maybe eventually wiping them all out and obviously it will become a lot harder because they'll end up meeting fabricants who were made later down the line or you know some newer fabricants and so you could kind of see how the stories job progress but there's also another group of people that get introduced and these are people who also hunt fabricants and they're just normal humans they all sort of live in this church dorm thingy but they've all been affected by fabricants in some way and so you know some of them want revenge i mean that's probably what most of them want a very dark setup for a story one of the first things that really caught my eye that really just made this series stand out is the whole idea of these fabricants being abandoned by the creator and being called failures by them and you could kind of see a, a little glimpse of this within the story through fabricant 100 when she kind of gets a little bit of a flashback to when she first woke up her, her first memories with the doctor and it kind of paints this picture that all these fabricants really want is to be accepted by the doctor although the doctor's dead so now they're just trying to become ideal humans for the heck of it i guess i also forgot to mention another more interesting side to you know the fighting part of this manga and that is that each of these fabricants at least a few of them that we have met have specialized body parts like the first fabricant we saw the one that was catching up to the train the one that stole the man's girlfriend he had specialized feet and so he could run very very fast and so you also get the rough idea that each of these fabricants is going to have some sort of special ability and be able to do something very crazy but exploring the whole concept of these fabricants being and are trying to become an ideal human it's really piqued my interest i think it's something that could be done very well and i also love ashibi too at least a little bit of what we've seen because ashibi his whole family has been killed by these fabricants obviously he's not in a very good situation but there's one point in this story where he meets a fabricant that can breathe underwater for a long or not breathe underwater but can kind of live underwater for a little bit because of their specialized lungs but after fabricant 100 and ashibi fight this fabricant ashibi says why couldn't the fabricant just be content with the fact that they had some good lungs that they were able to kind of live underwater almost why couldn't they just be content with you know having something special about them and so yeah it just makes ashibi out to be a sort of empathetic person or maybe sympathetic and again something that could be explored a bit more and yeah i just really love the whole concept of the ideal human but yeah it really sticks to the shonen formula we got action we got some i mean i guess within recent years we've been seeing a bit more of darker stories there's definitely been a shift within shonen from the more ambitious and brighter cherry characters to you know darker themes and stuff like that this manga definitely plays into those themes and in the recent chapters we've also seen a little bit of how this fabricant 100 how fabricants kind of manipulate human nature to trick humans to do stuff or at least this fabricant 100 the one that is with ashibi is kind of manipulating him trying to get on his good side to steal his body parts well not steal them but to make sure that she's able to get his body parts the fabricants trying to have this more twisted side to them it's a very interesting concept that i can see doing pretty well within the future if the story is able to make all these fights interesting able to explore some of the stuff within the story and really expand upon it i could see this series sticking around for a while and actually thriving within shonen the next one i want to talk about though is ichigoki's under control this is a i guess it's a lot more lighthearted. it's actually more of a comedy gag series so very different to fabricant 100 and it stars two characters the first one is called kai ichigoki and the other one 
one is called Misao Chisaki. So the premise for the series, Misao is actually Ichigoki's childhood friend. And throughout school, they sort of just drifted apart until one day, Misao went into Ichigoki's room and she was very small. She somehow managed to shrink herself and it turns out she's a mad scientist that is, I guess, sort of smart, but also does dumb things like shrinking herself. So the only way to turn herself back is to go to the zoo and get a whole bunch of uh, nuts. They have to collect uh, the nuts of a few of the zoo animals. And so Ichigoki, not really knowing what to do, he goes and tries to get some of the nuts from the zoo animals. As he's doing this, a uh, horny eastern gorilla or something like that, a gorilla, ends up killing him. But then he wakes up and he sees that half of his body is like a robot and so he's sort of this cyborg. The only bad part is that Miss Sal, his childhood friend, has to control him, has to kind of pilot him like a Gundam or something. So yeah, just based on the first chapter alone, you could really tell it's a lot more lighthearted, kind of a more comedy-centered story. Already within manga and stuff, it's very easy to just, you know, not read it. And I mean, even if you do give a manga a chance, especially early on, it's very easy to say that this series or this manga just sucks and you don't want to read it anymore, which is, you know, fair enough. But I feel like with comedy manga and comedy anime, I feel like it's even more so. It's kind of a more hit or miss type of thing. I think it's a lot more subjective. There's going to be people who like certain types of comedy. So yeah, already Ichigoki's under control trying to do comedy and stuff. It's going to be very hit or miss. But the whole gag of the series is that Ichigoki, he wants to go to school and try and, you know, live out his youth of being a high school student. It's something he's been looking forward to. And also, Misao wants to do this. And they have to try and blend in as a normal high school student, all while being in a very, you know, very absurd, very crazy circumstances. Yeah, just a lot of the jokes come from very crazy situations. Like, I think one of the first big situations is that there's this gorilla, the same horny gorilla that escapes the zoo and killed Ichigoki at the start, came back and is now chasing a woman that is carrying a whole bunch of bananas. And so Ichigoki, being a cyborg and being piloted by Misao, he somehow manages to defeat this gorilla. So already you could kind of get a feel for the comedy that Ichigoki is trying to, you know, trying to do. I think one of my favorite situations that Ichigoki and Misao get themselves into is that there's a student at their school that kind of figures out Ichigoki is a cyborg or that he isn't really a human exactly. And so this student is trying to expose Ichigoki. And what makes this even weirder, what makes this even crazier, is that the student emits like some pheromones and makes whoever is around her turn into a fan of her. And so the student just has a whole bunch of groupies around her at all times. There's people always at her beck and call waiting to do literally anything for her. And they are such big fans of this student that they don't even let her walk. They carry her everywhere. So yeah, there's this weird student that emits pheromones that attracts people to her and a whole bunch of students starts chasing Ichigoki at the command of the student tries to capture him and uh, I'm honestly not sure what her whole goal was but I guess to get him banned from school or something like that and eventually they end up on a roof the student as she's being carried falls off the back of her fan and starts to fall off the roof about to you know probably die and we get a little bit of a look into her backstory about how she's always been pimped and so Ichigoki saves her and says in the end the only person you can really rely on is yourself or you know you kind of have to do things yourself sometimes and so this is kind of where the story gets broken a little bit or maybe not broken but you kind of see a little bit more depth besides just this funny gag manga and so far within the story that's pretty much all it's been besides this one little chapter of the weird student but it just added a a little bit more depth to the story. I, I kind of saw it after this chapter that this manga, it can be a little bit more than just, you know, the funny, goofy gag manga that I thought it was going to be. The comedy itself, I kind of find funny. I, I don't really think I would keep up with it every week, but maybe every once in a while, between very long periods, I'd go back to it, kind of check it out. I'm not really the biggest fan of it, and really I'm not a super huge fan of comedy manga unless it's done very well, or 
unless you know it plays into my type of humor but if this manga is able to add that level of depth that i've saw then i think it can really grow become something a bit greater than just a stupid comedy manga but i guess at the end of the day that's all it is for now so there's definitely a lot to explore with that the last shonen jump manga the last kind of new shonen jump manga i want to talk about is cypher academy i've heard it's written by the same guy who's done monogatari or something like that i'm not really too sure but i guess what i like about the series is that it's kind of a bit more lighthearted than fabricant 100 but it's not as goofy as ichigoki's under control but the main character of cypher academy is called iroha irohazaka and i'll just be calling him iroha but iroha has enrolled in the school in the school you kind of have to solve puzzles and codes to do well and it also has elements of a normal school like it teaches you know the core subjects math social studies stuff like that but solving codes and puzzles is also a huge part of this school because it's actually kind of prepping people for the military and you kind of get this build up of the world that there are a lot of wars going on but honestly on the first few chapters it seemed boring to me the whole concept you know i really like my battle shonen and stuff like that so we get iroha uh, he kind of gets targeted by this uh i guess this weird bully at first what i thought was gonna be this antagonist of the story and she's called kiora toshusai and so the way conflict is sort of handled in this manga is through puzzles and codes we find out that iroha really didn't come to the school to try and become some super crazy cold solver in the military or anything like that the only reason he came is because tuition is free lunch is free and so that's really the big reasons and to go into a little bit more detail about this school the cypher academy it's mostly made up of girls and there's only about one boy in every classroom because it's kind of like a mandatory thing for the school to do it turns out iroha is actually the only boy in his class and so in the first little conflict we see between this kiora and iroha it's through a puzzle and if iroha fails then they kind of make a bet that he will have to transfer to another school called the trench academy and this academy is made up of mostly boys and it you know it's a bit more probably a bit more physical i'm i'm sorry i kind of forgot to mention another thing before kiora the weird bully picked on iroha and that is iroha in the first chapter he meets this other girl called kogoe and she was actually on the run from the sort of bully type girl kiora and iroha helped her get away from kiora and so that's why kiora kind of has it out for iroha and the kogoe girl gives some glasses to iroha to kind of solve the codes and it's sort of like a you know a secret weapon type of thing so when kiora tries to fight iroha using you know the cipher and codes iroha uses these special glasses to break all of them and this is kind of where you know one of my problems with the series came in and that was that iroha isn't really using his own abilities to you know solve anything and at first that's really what it seems like he's very heavily relying on the glasses but eventually throughout the first few chapters you kind of learn that iroha he's actually pretty smart even though in the first chapter the story didn't really make him out that way you kind of see that the glasses are only really being used to give iroha a little bit more information and context to some of the questions some of the ciphers some of the codes and then iroha uses that added context and stuff to actually solve the whole codes you know that's kind of handled a little bit weirdly but i just sort of accepted it but probably one of the biggest problems with this series is that some of the puzzles and stuff are in japanese are they are heavily intertwined with the Japanese language like kanji and stuff and so when Iroha has to solve all these questions all these ciphers it's kind of hard to follow it's hard to understand and you know I probably wasn't going to solve any of these questions or whatever in the first place but when Iroha gives explanations and stuff about how he solved the puzzles and whatever even then it's very hard to understand because you know it has a lot to do with the Japanese language so yeah as an English reader I it's kind of hard to follow and I really seen that being the biggest problem with this story is that when you think about other series that kind of go into these explanations about abilities even taking 
even look at something like JJK, it has a whole lot of explanations within the story. The explanations can kind of be a bit confusing, but you know, if you take your time and really read, really just pay attention, then you could see the whole gist of the ability. But within this story, I can't really follow anything. I can't really get the whole gist of things other than Iroha being able to solve the ciphers. So what I'm trying to say is that Cypher Academy, it's a very, you know, it's a very different type of story compared to things like JJK and even stuff like Fabricant 100 where, you know, a lot of focus isn't on fighting or anything like that. And it's more so on trying to solve puzzles and ciphers. You know, that's really the big conflict within the story. Well, maybe not the big conflict, but that's how conflict is sort of used within the story. And yeah, the biggest problem is it might not be super appealing to English readers. And I mean, there's some puzzles that, you know, don't have to do with language at all. The majority of what I've seen, it's definitely been relying on that a lot. But other than that, I think the story is sort of interesting because we also learned some more stuff about Kogoe, Kiora, and we haven't really learned anything about Iroha. I feel like the author is Debbie saving Iroha's backstory or yeah, background, trying to keep it private until they really want to dive into it and sort of give Iroha a bit more depth because there must be a reason why Iroha couldn't make it into any other school besides the Cypher Academy and why he has to go to a school that doesn't have tuition or anything like that. I think the story could really take an interesting direction exploring the main character's backstory. But other than solving ciphers and stuff like that, the bigger picture kind of gets established early on too. The students in the school, first off, they are very competitive. One of the first things that they try and compete with, with each other with trying to become sort of class president. But the big picture is that there is some money hidden within the school. And the only bad part about this money is that it's actually all in the form of cryptocurrency. That's just a weird concept already. Like even, you know, with this whole cypher stuff and not really being a fighting manga or a fighting shonen or anything like that, it's already pretty weird. But the main goal is to get this cryptocurrency. It's something like like 50 billion Morg, the crypto is actually called Morg. And so not all of these students know about this and Kogoe, Kiora, they already know about it and Iroha doesn't really learn about it until Kogoe talks to him about it. Yeah, if these students get their hands on it, then they'll be able to do some very crazy stuff. And so far from what we've seen, it has a lot to do with war. So yeah, using puzzles, codes, ciphers to somehow find this cryptocurrency, it's a very weird goal and it, it's sort of an interesting concept I won't lie I mean it kind of has to be if it's in Shonen. Cypher Academy as much as I've found it to be more problematic as the other two Shonen manga I actually find it to be one of the more interesting of the three and as much as I would really like to have a better understanding of how these codes and stuff how these ciphers are being broken I still like it I mean in the first few chapters I'm not gonna lie I thought it was worse than the other two but right now where we are in the story there's kind of a big fight in Iroha's class between all the students trying to become the class president and again there's a lot you could explore with this whole world of war and solving codes and ciphers to come up with solutions to conflict anyways though this video is a lot longer than I thought it would be if I were to kind of rank my interest within these three series it would go Cypher Academy, Fabricant 100, and then Ichigoki's Under Control. And that's the other thing too. Each of these series has less than 10 chapters. So there's definitely a lot more room to grow, but the only problem within Shonen is that the axe can come down at any time. It's very unpredictable and can be very unexpected. So however I feel about these series, it's obviously my own opinion. I think there's always gonna be people who like certain things and yeah, maybe you like each of these series a lot more than me and you would like to see these series continue to go on within Shonen Jump. And so regardless of whatever I feel about all these, you know, it would be great for these series to, you know, go on and get better, hopefully. Whatever the case though, thanks for watching. See you in the next one and peace.